Hi, everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel. I'm a draftsman and also the host of this show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 64, and I will talk with artist Justin Ryan Kendall. If you'd like to support the this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also by subscribing to my audio visual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is just gabriellahandle.com, one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay by prints of my drawings or leaving me a tip. Thank you very much for your time and attention in watching this episode, and do leave a comment so I know you watched this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, Justin Ryan Kendall, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. Welcome to my podcast, The Conversation About Art. You are episode 64. Let me make nice. sure. Give me, give me one second here. Just want to make sure about that. Episode 64, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for agreeing to talk to me. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do to start? Yeah, uh, well, my name is uh, Justin Kendall. I am a sculptor and businessman based in Brooklyn, New York. You uh, businessman? Yeah, I because I, uh, in addition to my own work, I also have a plaster cast business where I make and sell uh, plaster cast replicas to art schools, art students, collectors. Yes, I see. So, okay, okay. Um, all right. So, I'd like to know a bit about how you ended up being a sculptor. Yeah. So, I uh, I went to undergrad. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I went to undergrad at a, a big kind of contemporary art school there, uh, really with the intent of becoming my middle school art teacher, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the art education major, you have to take a bunch of different classes, you know, to get a, a kind of a nice survey of things. And it was then when I really discovered how much I enjoyed working with my hands um, and uh, took, a, you know, basic, basic sculpture course um, and just fell in love with it from there. Ended up adding sculpture as a second major, uh, dropping the education major altogether and just finishing with sculpture. Um, so... Yeah, it started, it started back in college. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I guess you did other, other stuff like drawing and painting as well. Yeah, before that, it was mostly, um, mostly acrylic painting, pen and ink drawing, you know, uh, every kind of high schooler, like just drawing the Beatles or, you know, uh, photos of Jimi Hendrix, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't until, um, college and then really where really where I got my real education was in Florence I started the Florence Academy of Art mm -hmm. and there that was half um, drawing half sculpting from life every day so mm -hmm. okay so you know I've heard I've heard what is kind of like the terminology I guess in quotes of drawing used in sculpture and vice versa as well um, you know, because not and not just because people will say sometimes, oh, that is such a sculptural drawing, but as you, one makes a drawing, or you know, that's kind of how I think about it in a way. Um, when one is making like the the valleys and and hills of the body, for example, it's like one is trying to kind of sculpt the flat surface into looking as if those um, valleys and hills were there, and then conversely in sculpting you know, sometimes, I mean, depending on how the sculpture works, I guess, uh, sometimes we have like the raking tools where you kind of, mm -hmm. kind of do like what is, uh, like analogous to, I guess, cross hatching when you do, you know, sure. um, so, you know, even, even though a sculpture is your main medium, I mean, what, what do you think about this relationship between, you know, argu arguably maybe all of the other traditional mediums and sculpture? Oh yeah. I mean, I think you can't really do one that well without the other. Uh, and in my training, uh, we focus heavily on drawing too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've since sort of neglected it. I haven't really drawn as much as I should be these days, mm -hmm. but uh, I certainly, at least on, you know, uh, on paper, I certainly draw on all my sculptures still. 
um, both just linear, like baking actual, you know, kind of lines in a clay that you can read from a distance, but also um, drawing with the, the notes of clay themselves in space. Um, I think uh, I'm certainly partial because it's how I was trained, but I find it to, to kind of result in a more integrated sculpture at the end of the day than um, necessarily kind of going at it with just getting masses of clay up and then raking away. Uh, I think the rake tool is certainly um, useful and sometimes you, you do have to remove material, um, but it's more of a surface thing for me uh, rather than how to arrive at form. Um, that's more in the drawing and the adding of clay. Mm -hmm. um, would you elaborate a little bit on this last part here or, or like, like repeat it? That it's yeah, more, it's more um, about the surface. Like it doesn't matter strictly whether you add or remove as long as, is that what No, you're... I'm saying, I think um, any sort of use of the rake tool for me, it would just be like surface finish. Mm. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, arrive at form uh, that way. That way I would build it up from the inside rather than just getting a bunch of clay on there. And then we kind of lovingly refer to it as rake and pray because it's just it's just kind of get clay up there and then just rake away until it kind of uh, see, yeah, starts yeah. to work mm -hmm. um whereas uh and there are people that do this beautifully it is mm -hmm. you know there's more than one way to make a figure for sure yeah, yeah. um but uh i kind of prefer uh having a little more control um and building it up slowly uh okay 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 so then the way in which you personally work i mean it, it, you know it, and i think it's kind of you could maybe think of it as like camps of people in a way, <laughs> you know, like sure. oh, you're, yeah, you're, you're like, you're like additive where you add and like, you know, you add play to your, the skeleton thing or whatever. And then that, that starts giving the, that, that is how you start getting closer to the final shape rather than having a bunch of clay to start with and then kind of removing in order to get to the final shape that you want. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you're, you're dead on about how there's like different camps, <laughs> uh, you can, for better and worse, uh, you can, or a lot of people would argue that you can certainly tell, or you can you can spot, let's say, where I went to school, Florence Academy, you can spot a Florence Academy sculpture from a mile away mm -hmm. based on how it was made. Uh, and you can say the same for other uh, educational styles. Um, but yeah, it's more, um, it's more about just taking a, a kind of slower, more maybe deliberate approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I think you can kind of always, there's always, you get this sense when it's done the other way, that the bad, most of the battle was done on the surface. It's like, I have clay here now, let me just rake it away and, and then arrive at what I'm trying to get at. Mm. Um, whereas uh, the way I do it and where I was trained other people, it's more um, that kind of struggle to arrive at form was done uh, from the inside and makes its way out. Um, it is a, a bit of a slower process. I think that's a lot of people's kind of gripe with it. With the additive it's, one? It just, yeah, it just seems like um, it takes a little bit longer maybe than just getting material up there and like getting like kind of a more planar, boxy maybe structure to start. Um, but I I kind of like the aspect of, of pacing yourself a bit. Um, particularly because models um, you find real easily or right kind of a way when you work from life is that models think into poses and, you know, after maybe the first or, or couple sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the kind of sl maybe slower, more methodical additive way gives you some time to let the model show you something better, maybe. It mm -hmm. uh, gives you more flexibility so you're not quite so locked in. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once you, once you get the method down though, it can, it can go quicker. Uh, it kind of, uh, you know, if you design it well and, and it's a well-drawn sculpture, things kind of just lock into place, uh, mm -hmm. by the end of it, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Um, have you, have you tried the other, have you ever tried the other method of having the, the chunk and then digging away at it? Uh, I mean, that's sort of how I just started because when I was an undergrad, there wasn't really any support really that much for any sort of traditional figurative sculpture. Um, 
except for his one teacher. Shout out Morgan Heron. He was a the the one figure modeling teacher I had in school. Um, so yeah, it is. It was kind of more just like let's get Clay up there, and you know rake back to a, a very generalized form. Um, that and that's really what I think it comes down to is I think uh, you can very easily end up sculpting what you know or what you think you know about nature in that way and you get left with uh something that's not quite as rich um uh or dynamic as it could have been mm -hmm. um because when i don't know just there's something about just removing like kind of large swaths of material it just it just it makes things a little bit more rounded and and general um it's kind of hard to describe um mm -hmm. but i've known i've seen in my own work where you know I'll take I take photos of work along the way, particularly when I was in school. And you can see how, you know, at this one stage of the project, it was just very dull the way the light fell across forms, which was not very dynamic rich at all. So I had to go back in there and kind of um kind of spruce things up a bit by adding um uh kind of smaller notes of clay to try to change up the surface a bit. Um so mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, it no, I mean, yes. That that's really quite interesting. It reminds me of. It reminds me of when. Uh, an artist, or you know, even teachers teaching uh, other artists, have. Such a formulaic. Way of drawing, the portrait or the, or the figure, that they end up drawing a figure, but it's not the figure that it's not the model. You know, right? Um, and I don't like that at all. I find it really quite irritating because it's like, I mean, not not in, not strictly in the way that you're saying because mine, my, I mean, not, it's mine is not based on experience. Like I, I, I don't, I don't. It's like I only did sight size once in my life, and I fucking hated it. Uh, did not really? like it at all. Yeah, yeah. I really, I was That's... like, I was like, what did you not like about it? Um. Were you just yeah, like, I, why am I holding this stupid piece of string? What was I using? Was it string? I think it was string. Um, it was probably string. I, I don't remember why I liked it. I, I didn't like it. I think I probably blocked it out or something. But yeah. um, but I was on the verge of super angry tears at after like three hours trying to do it. I mean, I did it. Yeah. I was able to right. uh, draw from a cast indeed, you know. Um, but I don't know. Anyway, the thing is that the the thing is that um you know even when somebody sometimes even it depends on the person of course even when somebody does in fact use a sight size or measuring or like these really specific steps sure, of like yeah the ears and the the cube of the head and stuff they end and uh they end up drawing a head just any head but sure. not the model you know and. Yeah. And um, yeah, I can kind of see a relationship between kind of trusting one's eyes more than the measuring because it's like your eyes know all the information you need. And it's like, if you're like carefully and deliberately adding on, you can, you know, notice the shape that it's taken, taking the, the sculpture that you're, that you're making. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess in a, in a way also, if even if you're doing like the subtractive method, it's like it's a matter of being observant enough to see that your thing looks kind of stiff. So it's like, so like, what do you think mm -hmm. about this? What do you think about this? So like, regardless of the method that the artist, the sculptor in this case that we're talking about sculpture is using, do you think it's rather a flaw in that case in the artist's observational skills that they can't see their thing is stiff or just off or that it looks like a head instead of the model's head. What do you think about that? It could be a flaw in the observation. It could also maybe even be a flaw in just the goal of the piece. Because um, I, I hear what you're saying about something maybe not looking uh, like the model. And that certainly happens. You'll be doing a portrait and you end up with the model's like cousin, right? It's not yeah, yeah. quite them. Um, and yeah, I think irrespective of whatever method you're using, um, uh, the that's just like a, the means to whatever end you're trying to get to and i think that um that needs to be pretty clear in your mind first 
or at the very least you need to find that along the way. Um, you know, otherwise you're going to end up with something and maybe not quite as exciting. And, you know, it also depends on the context because there's, you know, is it just a, a school project, right? Is it just a two week portrait? You know, is it a learning exercise that you can, you can get a certain amount of and, um, Maybe maybe you you still make a mold and and have a, a copy of it later just for posterity. But um, and you know the difference between that and then being out of school and now you're making work that is important to you, um, and then you need to imbue it with whatever quality. Like you have to be able to give the qualities to get your ideas across. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it is helpful to. Uh, another good thing I like about um, maybe taking a little bit more time on a sculpture is you you give yourself time to talk yourself out of bad ideas mm -hmm. um, so that you can come back, you know, maybe a couple of days later with a fresh eye and see, is this really working? Um, does something need to be changed? Because um, hopefully most people kind of know when something's not going the way it should be and you have the the conviction to just like fix it and stop it and not just finish this thing that isn't, you know, um, there's a line in that, uh, uh, I've only seen the movie actually, the, the agony, the ecstasy by Irving stone. They made a Charlton Heston version where he's Michelangelo, but there's a line that where, uh, they go, if the wine is sour, throw it out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. If, uh, yeah. if something's not going right, it needs to be changed or abandoned because, um, why, why finish something that you know you're not gonna believe in yeah that reminds me a little bit of um you know when i'm making drawings myself and i catch that you know I'm, I'm drawing and i'm looking at my reference and it's it's not looking quite right it's not looking quite right and i'm like all right it's just that i'm not drawing the reference in the sense that i can see that in the reference this shape or whatever is going in this way but then I'm drawing it slightly like this way you know mm -hmm. and it's like all right I obviously have to erase the thing in my drawing and freaking do it the way that I see it and sometimes that is yeah. really difficult for whatever reason I, I don't Absolutely. really understand why but it is really difficult to be like all right I have to it erase it very now precious. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I was I was similar um one of the biggest like first kind of breakthroughs it sounds so simple looking back but um is drawing when I would draw in figures in the model room is using uh, much straighter lines because mm. uh, it's it's a great exercise just to to look at any kind of cross section of the body and because you, you you see like a, like a wristband and you think it's just like a like one curved line will will uh, designate that but if you look really look at it, there's like a dozen smaller straighter oh, lines yeah, that yeah. break up all these angle breaks. Um, and uh, so that was a big, a big change is just really, really observing and seeing just all the variety there. Because mm. uh, that's the most exciting thing. It's, and it's the reason why, you know, so many people go when you're in this kind of, for lack of a better word, representational realism, whatever you want to call it. They're like, oh, why don't you just take a photo? Uh, and it's like, well, why don't you then you're just take locked a photo? In. Yeah, exactly. And then you're just locked in. Whereas like I can, you know, uh, in a given model pose, maybe they come back in this next 20 minute, 25 minute session and they're doing, they're giving you something much better that works really well for the drawing, like maybe towards the hip, right? And then you can capture that then. Mm. But, uh, and then in another one, you can come back and, and do something different. And you, so there's, there's way more dynamic things you can get yeah. um, that way. Yeah, that's really true about the working with the, with the, with the model. And, and it's like, I get extremely pissed off when people are super whiny about the model, the, the fidgety, breathy stuff, settling into poses sure, and stuff. Yeah. It pisses me off so freaking much. And it pisses me off more still as having like regularly modeled for art classes for a little uh, while. Yeah. And it's like, like Jesus Christ, dude, it's a living body. Okay. But all right. So um, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Exactly. Well, just like, I, if I just try to take a, just a normal easy contrapposto i start to go crazy after 45 seconds yeah. so i can only imagine what models go through doing 25 30 minute sessions whatever it is uh yeah uh some movement is isn't gonna really rub me the wrong way um and i was very lucky in florence um our models were great there there was really never any issues they would take 
like very ambitious poses mm. it was very collaborative and they uh they felt a part of it which was nice um that's cool so that's what you're looking for with the model yeah yeah it's just that it's just that um i i feel like it's an amateur thing to complain about that stuff because that dynamism of the body and it's not just like the obvious stuff like breathing but like everything that's going within circulation digestion just everything yeah, that absolutely. you can think of hair growing, you know, like even stuff that you don't even uh, maybe realize that is, that is, it's not obvious to the eyes. It's like, it is that very thing, like the model model is fidgeting as well. It's that very thing that allows one when drawing the figure to get away with so much. <laughs> yeah. Because I feel like, I feel like I haven't done it in a, in a little while, so I, I don't know, but I always felt like I could get away with a ton when I was drawing from the from the model because they were moving so much. And it's like, you know, if, if maybe they're moving like fidgeting or whatever it is within a range, it's like you have that entire range of angles to then incorporate into your drawing. And then you kind of, I don't know, I just, I just like, it's like this very interesting back and forth that is, you know, part involuntary because the model is not deliberately moving. Sure. And and voluntary be on the part of the artist because it's like we're the ones that choose what we're gonna stick with, and where we're gonna be flexible when we're making the drawing, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it's like it's like a really kind of it's a dialogue in a way between or just like this interaction between all these variables in that situation. Um, well, and it right. can help you m maybe push push a pose too and make something a little more exciting. Yeah. That, um, because it's not, you know, uh, ideally you're not, because otherwise you would just take a photo, right? Like you're trying to get something more, something, maybe reach something that like a, a human uh, could be and maybe ought to be. And that maybe that requires capturing them at two different, a couple different times throughout the pose. Mm. So, I mean, just look at any, you know, Michelangelo drawing or sculpture. Uh, he's certainly taking liberties there. Um Indeed. So I think it's extremely valid. So, okay. Um. All right. So, Mr. Kendall, what is art in your opinion? What is art? Um. Okay. I don't know that I can answer this in a way that's very succinct and cogent and satisfying, but I will certainly give it a try. Oh, um, yes, please. Uh, one thing before, maybe before defining it, uh, one thing I like to always try to remember about it is that it is re a requirement for living. It is, is super necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that because we deal as humans, we deal with so much, um, in abstractions with big ideas, you know, around truth um beauty uh purpose things like that we need something to concretize those ideas and reflect back to us mm -hmm. and i think that's uh the main purpose the art serves um it's i think because it's tough because uh, i'll go to a museum let's say i think there's something that um there's some quality to certain things that elevates it like i love since i was a kid the um uh, like the arms and armor section of any museum, right? Mm -hmm. Like I want to see the swords and everything like that. And then you get close to them and there's something that elevates it beyond uh, just this weapon of violence to being more, to perhaps being art. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all kinds of like maybe little hard to pin down qualities that, you know, like what's the difference between like a bowl and like a, like a, really nice bowl, I don't know, uh, like an art, an art piece. Um, for what I do, for what I think mm, might be, I'm willing to admit that it may be closed-minded, but I think uh, in terms of, as far as art goes, um, figurative art uh, is certainly like the highest kind of form of it. Um, so to, to my mind, art would be, uh recreate a selective recreation of nature um based on the individual artist's value judgments right i mean compare for instance what i mean by that is like compare how the greeks or you know the the renaissance 
artists were depicting the human form with that of like, you know, the Byz Byzantine, like early Christian, you know, on one hand you have like heroic, capable, beautiful, and then the other is like hunched, like uh, in pain, martyrs, you know, there's, there's two different senses of life there. Um, and reflect two different sort of value systems back perhaps. Um, so yeah, I think um, that's what I would maybe start to try to define it as this, this recreation of reality um, done through an artist's mind, according to their judgment, uh, their, their value judgments. Um, and it's no coincidence that I would be drawn to the figure uh, if I believe that, because I think that um, that's the most fruitful kind of territory to, like for instance, uh, the David, you know, and or any uh, most of the Davids, like even Bernini's David, um, that is, you know, a man that is like um, certainly strong, full of self-esteem, capable, confident, uh, is capable of, you know, being equal to this world and uh, achieving all that he wants in it. Uh, and you, you look at that and that inspires you, that reflects, you know, back to you what you could be. Um, so maybe that's a little bit hitting on of what art is and what it should be. I don't know what you think about that. Maybe not answer, but I hope I got something there. No, no, you definitely got something there. Um, okay, so, so, so in your opinion, it's specifically figurative, representation i mean representation of the figure and nature um like i mean in on through through the like the filter of the body of an artist meaning like you mm -hmm. know the artist is using to draw or sculpt something uh they want to reproduce something they saw in nature okay but then this last part that you said about like the David and the David being confident and strong and capable. Um, I feel like there's something about, I feel like there's something about the work of art being made, being an ideal to inspire the viewer to be, to like try to reach for the ideal to try to be like the ideal. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it depends. It doesn't. I don't know that it has to necessarily like beat you over the head with it. Like I'm not necessarily into super didactic work um, that has like a long artist statement tied to it. You know, I'm I'm more. I mean, mostly I'm concerned with just form. Um, I think that is and can be a narrative all in itself. Um, but yeah, you, I think you look at. Um, the way humans are depicted in certain sculpture and painting and uh it's you know it can be aspirational um mm -hmm. so i also think it's important though that there can be a, a hierarchy of values in this like you can you could maybe say like it's okay to like a lot of different stuff you mm -hmm. know um like i'm certainly not here to tell somebody that they can't like or listen to or you know like even with music like there's like fun pop music that you want to listen to and but you you just kind of know also that it, it is not in the same realm as you know a work of a great master i think yeah. the same could be done in, in visual art where it's um you know fun to look at the stuff and even even abstract stuff you know i certainly can uh enjoy looking at uh, non-representational form uh particularly when it's something um that i don't know how it's made you know, like I, if I don't know the language of a certain material, that part is interesting to me, but mm -hmm. it, it's almost like a different thing. And it would just be kind of uh, lower, maybe on my hierarchy there. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, I liked the, I liked the comparison with music a lot because um, even though I don't know about making music or anything, I can definitely tell that there's something that is different between um you know like Britney Spears <laughs> and uh all right I know some classical music 
like Beethoven. you know you know, yeah like Beethoven or Bach or something like that you of know? course and and I mean not just because they obviously sound different but at the same time it's like the skill involved in making both of those things is obviously very different and at the same time and I mean you know similarly to how there's camps for you know the thing about reductive or subtractive uh, or additive sculpture there are of course camps that uh, also for music but at the same time it's like I, uh, I, I, you know, we forget that the one Britney Spears basically could not exist if Beethoven didn't before. For sure, yeah. You know, and so like similarly to, similarly to like, you know, Rothko would not be able to exist if it wasn't because like the pre-Raphaelites existed before. And at the same time, there's, there's like this other thing, you can tell me what you think about this too. Um, the argument, for example, in the case, I guess, of conceptual and abstract type work, that it's like original or something, or they have, we wanted to like break the rules and stuff. And it's like, at the same time, it's like, I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen bold planes of color before. It's like, he didn't invent that because if you look at the sky, you're looking at a plane of a uh, bold color, for example. Or if you think of an abstract that's like, oh, shapey shapes and with color and stuff, it's like, have you looked at a, have you seen the pictures of nebulas? Have you looked at clouds? Right. I mean, because you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, so it's like, I don't really understand this, the, this kind of, kind of scoffing at uh, tradition or something like that in, in order to, or, or you know, like kind of, kind of like wanting to break free from that instead of like, like enjoying it and exploring more within it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know, I, because I agree with you about the figure. It's like, I don't see myself getting tired of drawing the portrait, for example, because I have I, I have a strong tendency towards the portrait, very strong tendency towards the portrait. And it's like, I don't see myself ever getting tired of like, basically repeating, like, oh, um, uh, eye socket to like zygomatic to, you know, like, it's like, I can do that sure. so many times. And it's like, I still don't get it, you know? So yeah, what do you think about the rant? <laughs> well, um, there's some arguments uh, about uh, that work that I, I don't find particularly um, useful. Like when people people look at like oh, oh, uh, Andy Warhol or Rothko or whatever, and they say, oh, like I could do that. And it's like, well, in one sense, I guess, but you know, this this guy made this and sold it for millions of dollars. Certainly, if you could have painted a, a can of soup and sold it for lots of money, you would have done it and not be bitching about it. So there's like, some, I get, you know, there's some of those where I'm just like, that doesn't, it just doesn't, I guess at the end of the day, I just don't really care. Like I'll walk through the, I go to the Met quite frequently and I'll look, I always go through the, the contemporary abstract, you know, whatever you want to call it wing. And, um, you know, I, I, I'll just, I like to look at the stuff. Um, I don't necessarily think one. So here's one way I like to think of it, um, is if you were at a concert, right. For maybe a band you didn't know, you don't know the lyrics or anything like that and you're sitting there and you're trying to sing along um when it would have just been better if you had like just hummed and kind of just taken it in mm -hmm. um that's why i kind of think about um looking and trying rather than just trying to find like the, the deeper meaning you know to a work um like i know people can write pages and and paragraphs about a rothko i certainly can't to me it's just a big canvas with color on it um and that's okay. Um, uh, people can just kind of have their, their own, but you know, at the same time, I'm willing to die on the hill. The per perfect example, actually, I was in Rome a couple of years ago and at the Borghese, where they have the famous Bernini sculptures, they were doing a concurrent show of Damien Hirst sculptures. Mm -hmm. And it, there's, there's never been a more di like clear dichotomy between like beauty and like, you know, garbage. So, but yeah. and, like, you can think that stuff is cool. Like there's certain parts of it that are like kind of cool or even funny, um, ironic, you know, but um, every, every honest person knows when they walk into that gallery at that time, that there's something different between Bernini's David or Bernini's Apollo and Daphne and whatever stuff Damien Hirst had fabricated for that show, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I don't really get too hung up on it. People can like what they like. And I, I like to look at a lot of different things um, uh, and stay a little open-minded, but there's also some like, 
you only have so much time and energy you can devote to places. So I, I know that uh, if I hear about a certain show that's going to be somewhere, I can most of the time safely kind of write that off and be uh, convinced that it wouldn't, you know, necessarily have been worth the while. Um, and I, and it's possible that maybe I'm wrong and then I, I really should have gone because it would have opened my eyes to something. Um, but I think those are very few and far between um, generally. Mm -hmm. But you should look at, I wish go, there's probably an image of it. Look at that show, Damien Hurst was the Borghese and just the work that was there uh, in juxtaposition to the, the work that's normally in the gallery. Um, it's it's kind of funny to see. I hope whoever set that music, I hope they got paid well for having that show there, but it was kind of wild. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can't promise that I will, but I'll try just because like, I, I have feelings about uh, Damon Hurst. Mr. Hurst, yeah, of course. I, mean, yeah. I think many of us do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I'm kind of curious about what you're saying that you know you'll you'll still look at stuff that isn't representative of nature and the figure, um, just in case they, it has something to tell you or something. Because uh, yeah, it's probably not going to tell me anything. Um, and even a lot of I don't know, just a lot of figurative work, even though I do love, doesn't necessarily tell me things. Um, because like I said before, I'm not really trying to there to try to figure out the words to that song. I'm just there to kind of experience it and listen to it and then be about my day. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, if someone, you know, I'll, I'll go to, you know, uh, the MoMA or wherever just to look at stuff and, you know, uh, maybe I only spend 15 seconds with it, you know, uh, but um, I'm not completely closed off from it. But it doesn't, it's it's certainly nowhere near the top of my hierarchy uh, of value when I go to, to look and experience art. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just that um, I, I kind of want to compare our, like, you know, whatever you knew about art and art history growing up or something, or while you formed your artistic skill uh, versus my own, because... Um, so I just thought that I kind of had to live with or tolerate the, you know, anything can be art and, you know, who am I to say what is art um, or whatever. You, just stuff that is, like you said, trash, basically, especially compared to something that is obviously art. Um, and it's like, that's actually one of the reasons for which I started the podcast, because I kind of want to cleanse that and soothe yeah. that in a way that it's it's like, all right, I, you know, to kind of learn that they're, so that I can learn that it's okay for me to be like, that's not art for me. That's not art. For sure. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, but, but it's like, it's like a new thing, you know, and, and uh, I've been reading um, Dennis Dutton's The Art Instinct, and he talks about how these cases of these cases that sit at the extremes of whether something is art or not that you, you know, you can sit all night talking about it and be like, yeah, it is. No, it isn't. Why? Because, you know, um, like the fountain and like this kind of stuff. And it's like in, you know, he argues that it's better to note the characteristics of the things that are obviously art, like the Tiepolos and Pantormos or the, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm versus trying to determine whether the things at the edges are art or not. You know, so um, that seems really quite helpful. But then what do you what do you think? I mean, um, how has, I mean, has your idea about what art is or isn't changed a lot throughout your life? I mean, were you less tolerant before of things that are, I'm gonna keep calling them trash, uh, things that were yeah. trash, um, were you, okay with it before versus now you're like, I mean, I guess I'll look at it, but whatever, you know, I mean, how, how has that changed for you? I'm much less tolerant and it's very freeing to be so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so <laughs> I have so many fun memories of undergrad um, being in that critique room and expected to be able to talk about what was in front of me. And to a certain extent, you know, I don't, like everybody was there like young college kids. We didn't really know what we're doing or, or have the skills to 
really make what we wanted to. Um, but it was always interesting just to be able to hear like the people could go on for minutes about the thing, whatever was in the room. And it was just like, I have nothing to say about this. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, fair point, like there wasn't much to say about what I was making either. Um, and part of that was there was always this tension, right, between, you know, I just wanted to make um, just even just like a nice hand or a portrait. Um, but I thought at the time that for that to be acceptable, it had to have some like weird element to it. You can't just make a portrait. It's got to be made out of, you know, uh, like pink, that pink or blue styrofoam. Like it's got to be contemporary or mm -hmm. it's got to have um, just some weird, um, preferably grotesque element to it, right? To get any sort of attention because otherwise it's just this weird archaeological thing and what are you doing? But uh, now it's just, I'm very okay with just writing off something as, mm -hmm. you know, that's clearly garbage. Like mm -hmm. I can laugh at it. I, I hope that it brings some sort of maybe a little bit of joy uh, to some, like um, not to go too hard, but like that recent, I don't know if you saw that recent um, big MLK monument and I think it was Boston the the like disembodied arms kind of hugging you had to have heard about this no uh, i, I kind of deliberately look at don't up, pay attention a, to culture uh-huh there you go well there's <laughs> a, a very big and very bad sculpture was made for public consumption um it's supposed to be um based off a photo of mlk hugging his wife after he just found out he won the nobel peace prize mm. but it's it's just the like arms kind of hugging um, and it's just, it's very bad. And it was, it had to have been bad at all stages, but because like, there's certainly a, uh, a, a good, like kind of political message behind it. Everybody was just like, we got to just kind of go with it. We're just in this suicide pact now, even though it could have been done much better. Cause yeah. if you don't, if you don't know about the history of it, just looking at it, you have no idea what it is. Mm. Um, and I'm okay with just completely writing it off and just, you know, um, it, it, you know, people, people can like what they want to like, um, but at the end of the day, put somebody in front of the Pieta, put something in, in front of that, like all honest people know which one of these is um, real art, or if you want to call it all art, okay, but then just put it in a hierarchy and, you know, um, some things belong at the top. Mm, yeah. yeah. That, rem that reminds me a little bit of the, the portraits of the Obamas. Um, when, because mm, mm. I mean, I guess, I guess maybe I'm not that disconnected from culture, like I just said, but, but I mean, I, I know of those from Instagram because a couple of colleagues posted about them in their stories and they were like, these are terrible. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, oh, I was, I was kind of like, oh, they said they're terrible, <laughs> you know, uh, in that, in that, I mean, they're not, they're nothing out of the ordinary. I don't think so either. Um, yeah, I yeah, I wouldn't say they're they're not mind blowing or anything. It's like uh, you know, I mean, yeah. they look like them. Okay, good yeah. job. <laughs> it's like you tried, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, those are yeah, those are. I mean, fine. I think too. Um, there's all. It just depends on what you can do with a subject too. Like, um, you know, something like for me in particular, the reason why I'll never get a public commission is because I would just want the figure to be nude. Um, mm. But like I be sculpting a, a famous person in a suit. Uh, I have no interest in that. And I probably wouldn't even be good at it. I've tried, I used to work for a studio here that does a lot of that and, and the best way that you can do that. But I'm not gonna sit there and sculpting like buttons and stuff. It's just, so um, same with those paintings. It's like, you, you know, you have to, if I remember correctly, the, uh, a lot of the interesting things, those were the background, like, uh, like uh, President Obama was like going into a bush, I think, something like that. There was like the, the like backgrounds. Of the, that's what, yeah, I think that's what people liken it to. But I, I'm pretty sure uh, with those paintings, <laughs> the backgrounds were kind of, uh, in, in some ways, the most interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just it just depends on the nature of the project, what you might be able to pull from it. Um, and the problem with those two is it's so committee driven. Mm, yeah. right um people that are not practitioners of art 
telling artists what to do. Mm. And, you know, that's kind of a, a whole another discussion in itself, but it's usually not something I'm very interested in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Kendall, then what is beauty in your opinion? What is beauty? Um, I would say a good place to maybe start to get an answer to that would be thinking of it um, as harmony um, and integration, because there's lots of different ways you could approach trying to define that. I think um, like a one obvious one would be like, do, do I like to look at this thing? Well, mm -hmm. I certainly want to look at it maybe every day. Um, but that doesn't quite get it there because off the top of my head, I can think of, um, do you know the artist Kath Kalwitz? Yeah. Yeah, so her, you know, really sort of uh, emotional portraits of like a mother and her child or her, her dead or dying child, um, you wouldn't necessarily want to like just look at that every day when you woke up, like bright and sunny, you know, but it's, there's still a quality to it that is beautiful. Um, things that are scary and sorrowful can still be also beautiful. So that, that, that you know, maybe doesn't satisfy the definition. Um, other people probably take it the most often is just, you know, is this thing sexually desirable? Mm. Um, but that's so clearly and obviously not the only criteria because um, some, you know, if we're talking about people like someone who like is physically attractive could like be a horrible person so and right. not... You know, so that doesn't do, so I would say it's more about um, integration and harmony of, of, of all the, the things that you're trying to uh, convey. Um, no, no caveats, no contradictions in it. Um, that might be, I don't know what you think about that, that the idea of integration or, or harmony being yeah. kind of getting us there. Yeah, I like the harmony part a lot. And, and I mean, I guess the harmony leads to integration. It reminds me of a teacher that I had at the New York Academy. I mean, he still teaches there. His name is Randy McIver. Mm. And um, he's freaking amazing. And he's like this Renaissance man type guy because he's like, he sculpts, paints, and draws. There you um, go. He's, he's kind of ridiculous. And um, I gush about him every chance that I get. And um, he, in, in teaching it, teaching us to draw the figure of observing like the relationships between things. He was like, yeah, look, there's like this curve and then there's this counter curve. It's like really simple. He will be talking about these relationship between curves. There's like the ones that, you know, they're kind of like a parenthesis and the ones that are like kind of off like this. And then there are the ones that kind of echo each other sort of like in the shape, you know, and there's um, those relationships between the shapes and the curves and the things that look straight and the the circles and like all of this stuff uh and not just within the figure but it's like if you look at nature as well there's like you know that harmony and that relationship between shapes and forms is why one cannot stop looking at the horizon or at trees yeah or at a tree trunk you know, or at a little squirrel or a flower or something because they have, because they have the, those relationships that seem to just, that are then, you know, they're, they have a harmony among, um, within the one, you know, the one, the flower or whatever, but then it's all like integrated into this whole as part of this whole that has this aesthetic that I guess, you know, if you're a representational artist that does nature or the body, you know, you're trying to do it over and over again to try to get why. Because, you know, we can say harmony and shapes all day, but it's like at the same time, it's like, because I guess that's why I can still ask what is art and what is beauty again and again, because it's like, okay, but but why, <laughs> you know? Right, why yeah, does it it's, work? Very, it's very hard to pin down. And then even as we talk about it, I'm thinking, um, that's why I kind of, I think maybe I like integration better than harmony, because you mm. can think of... Um, like, uh, it's a good example. I don't know, uh, Adrian Brody, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like, there's uh, a lot of harmony there, but then, like, he has, like, this broken, like, very crooked nose, but it's, like, it makes it more unique and interesting, and sometimes that interruption of a design, you could say, mm -hmm. to call it, you know, the interruption of his design, um, 
can sometimes make make something better, more beautiful, for instance. Um, uh, like I certainly, there's a lot of more like dynamic sculpture out there than um, maybe uh, an older Greek piece that you could you could definitely call the Greek one more harmony, um, just like being very idealized and symmetrical, and everything like that. But then sometimes um, something needs a, a little a little dash of something extra to make it um, kind of push and go to a, a different place. Mm. Yeah, in the, in the sculpture sense, it really makes me think of, all right, now I don't remember all the names of all the sculptures, but there's this one that's at the Met of um, the guy with his sons. Yeah, Carpo, Ugolino and his sons. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. And... Uh, that's a very, very good sculpture. That's top 10, oh, maybe top it's five sculpture. It's, it's like ridiculous. Good. Yeah, it's ridiculous. If you, if you couldn't ever study sculpture, not to interrupt, but if you couldn't ever <laughs> study sculpture, looking at that sculpture can teach you pretty much everything except, you know, how to describe the female form, I suppose. But um, <laughs> it, everything, so much about that is just amazing. Yeah. yeah no, I would love is... to see the original clay. Because um... he didn't... He, he didn't carve that. You know that, right? No. So Carpo didn't carve his marbles. He would he would sculpt the original clay, and then a workshop would do the carving. Oh. Um, and then maybe he maybe they'd leave him like a quarter of an inch material. He'd come around and do some like finishing touches. But he wasn't he wasn't there with a chisel. He wasn't like Michelangelo carving it. But um, he would have sculpted the clay. Um, and in my opinion, a sculpture never looks better than it does in the clay. So I like I would always love to see, you know, think of that in clay. But go ahead, back to the, the carpo. Um well, but I want to ask you about that now. <laughs> because because it because like when you're talking about the sculptures like with marble and with rocks, that's reductive. Which yes. which which you're you're like not into. So Oh, uh, so actually I'm glad we kind of came back to this because it's not that I'm not in like I would still say the 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 kind of rake and pray method that's still added like that's still I wouldn't quite call that just reductive because mm. with marble it's like uh, it's just that you you physically can't put stone back onto it I mean you can you can sort of like glue and stuff but it's not really it's supposed to be just taken away um, that's that I, I have no qualms with that at all that's just that's how that's literally the only way you can you can work with stone. Um, it's it's the the idea of um, the raking away. I just think I think you end up getting more generic forms because mm. it's just um, it just becomes a more like kind of blocky in one sense. Like that's the goal, and it's a good goal to develop structure early, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the whole reason I think it's done um, to get like a plainer sense of at the very at the, at the very least at the end of the day you have a head, you have a recognizable head, mm. right? Um, but it's just the problem of taking it from there to try to give it um, a little bit more vitality and variety of form. I think is that's harder to do when you're just taking clay and removing it. Um, I think you end up just kind of um, almost just like smudging away truth. Like you, you had, you could have had some really nice points of truth and form established, and then you, you kind of just erased it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair, so. and and also because I mean, and I I'm inclined to agree agree with you because, you know, if you can just add more clay, you can get away with a ton of just making all the mistakes in the world. But it's like you cannot get away with anything when you're working on the rock, you know. You oh, can't. not at all. That's why yeah. that's what makes um, Michelangelo so interesting, in my opinion, because um, typically what would have been done is you would have you'd make your clay clay model and then you produce a plaster version that then you use a pointing machine to, to be able to take measurements off the plaster to go to the stone. So you knew exactly where to carve and to stop carving. Mm. Um, but I think I'm right about this by most of the available evidence. This was not how Michelangelo worked. He would just take the stone from like one vantage point and just kind of go right at the stone from there. I mean, obviously he worked in the round of it, but it kind of always, you can kind of always tell in, in his work that there's one central view that's like really designed to be like that's the like that's the the sweet spot to look at. So that's what's so interesting about him that 
because it is it's a very uh expensive undertaking if you mess up stone like that's it you know yeah you need so, a whole other stone <laughs> that, that he would go with with the sped thing with the pointing machine is, is pretty badass you know mm. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, back to the Carpo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, what, I don't know what like um, period Carpo is from, but it makes me think of, um, I mean, I was trying to get to the like uh, mannerist Rococo type. I know that they're not the same, but like that style sure, sure. that is very uh, curvy and kind of like stylized and stylish and a little bit exaggerated and stuff. And I, and I do, and I feel like they were studying those relationships between curves and shapes with making those exaggerated curves and these really frilly turning twisting forms um to i don't know to kind of maybe expand upon what is already in nature because like those curves are already there those shapes are mm -hmm. already there but then if you like expand something and make it more swollen or or curvy or, or something or you know or um like who was it Pontormo I mean he's still his mannerist right um you know like making people really long yeah yeah so like that exploration it's like further exploration of, of nature like I don't really I don't really understand um why so many people or you know why somebody would be like oh that tradition is like this or that or the other when there's like so much to learn still about nature and the body you know for sure and well, and it's funny that you mentioned the Carpeau because in that, go back and look at that piece, he took some liberties um, with with certain parts of the anatomy to, I think, make it make more sense visually. Mm -hmm. Go back and look at it. And the the central, the main, the man figure, Ugolino, uh, look at his head from the side. There's not enough cranium there. Mm -hmm. There's like a part missing, but it's because of the angle I think if he were to add it, it would just, it would look off from viewing it from the front. Um, and as I think it was supposed to always be viewed at that height too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so, cause that's important too, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's an example too, of just artists saying, I know this anatomy is supposed to be there and look like this, but I'm going to change it because it better suits my needs. Um, so that's an interesting part about that sculpture. It's it's very subtle. It's just like a small amount of like the back of the head, top of the head that's missing. I feel like that there should it should be there, but it works too. Mm. Okay, all right. Well, um, Mr. Kendall, we have reached the we have reached the fifty five minute mark of this conversation. So, um, is there anything else you want to add uh, before we start closing out the episode? Um, where can people find your work? Uh, what are you working on lately? Is there anything you want to add? Do you have any projects? Yeah, uh, I'm moving into this new studio right now. Uh, so I'm slowly getting some new work in the mix. Um, people can find out, follow along what I'm doing, um, mostly on Instagram. Uh, it's at Justin Ryan Kendall for my kind of personal page. And then if you also want to see about the, because uh, a lot of artists use these plaster casts. Uh, as drawing references, uh, you can go to uh, fountainheadcasts.com and the full collection is there. Yes, the Fountainhead Gypsoteca. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Justin. And thank you everyone for watching and listening. Uh, again, special thanks to my guest, Justin, for agreeing to talk to me and for your time. If you'd like to support Justin, my podcast, myself, or all three, all corresponding links will be in the caption. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you saw this episode. Also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel. And so thank you very much, everyone, and see you next time. Bye.